Y'all like to eat? Anybody here like to eat? I like to eat. I don't like to eat by myself, though. I know that's a big surprise for everybody that I don't like to be by myself. But oh, by the way, it's donut Sunday, so if you like to eat, make sure you grab a donut on your way out. But some of my favorite times are when I'm eating with people, right? When people are gathered at my house around the table, or I've been invited to their house, or we're sitting at a restaurant somewhere. I bet that's probably some of your favorite times too, because it's not, it's not so much about the food, although the, the food can, can be pretty good, right? But it's about the people that we're spending the time with, maybe the celebration that we're having, or maybe it's just a regular day and things are calm for once and we get to pay attention to the people that we love. All this is important to us because, like I said, it's not, it's not so much the food that fills us, but the people that we're with. Let's hear from Luke 22 this morning. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death. And they were afraid of the people. And then Satan entered Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, and he went away and conferred with the chief priests and the officers of the temple police about how he might betray him. And they were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray him to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter to John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us so that we may eat it. And they asked him, where do you want us to make preparations for it? And he said, listen, he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. So make preparations for us there. So they went and they found everything as he told them and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is upon this table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. And then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. Now I know that passage is pretty familiar to us as we recite part of it each and every week. And this meal that is served, that Jesus is with his beloveds. You know, Jesus, he liked to eat too, right? He liked to feed people. Many of his parables and ministry moments involve food. He fed 5,000 people. Yeah, remember that miracle? He taught before meals, like the time at Mary and Martha's house. He got in trouble all the time by the elite because he ate meals with people who were deemed unacceptable because food wasn't just for sustenance. 
When you ate with someone, you were doing more than simply feeding them or yourself. You were accepting them into your life, aligning yourself with them, saying, these people, these people are my kind of people. So it's not really that different from today. We socialize through meals, our biggest celebrations and holidays often uh, involve food, and it might seem like that's not a big deal, but what do those times signify to us? That we care about one another. You know, in the last week, I've heard from four different people that they want a church potluck. Now, is that because potlucks always bring out the best food? I mean, on occasion, you get somebody's specialty, right? And that runs out pretty quick. It's not because potlucks are okay food-wise, but why do we do it? Because we want to spend time together, because we care for one another, show that we're interested in one another, and most importantly, that we accept one another. That's what it's all about. But perhaps the most astounding account that involves Jesus in a meal is when Jesus fed Judas. I don't think I could do that. I don't think I've got that in me. What do you think for you? Judas's name is synonymous with betrayal and treason, but the story, you know, it didn't start out that way. Like, that's what we think of as the end, but it didn't start out that way. Judas was issued an invitation to follow Jesus just like all the other disciples. And he accepted that invitation just like all the other disciples. Maybe part of the point of this story is that any one of them could have done this to Jesus. And that's why they all sat around and looked at each other all puzzled like saying, ah, could that be me? Could that be me? Now we don't know why. Judas betrayed Jesus. What motivated him to do such an awful deed? Was it the money? Was that the motivator? The little carrot dangled out in front of Judas to get him to do such a terrible thing? Was it it worth what it cost him? Now, we don't know for sure. Imagination tells us it could be desire. It could be that greed for more. That could be Judas's story. Judas was presented with an opportunity, perhaps was already prone to that type of temptation and fell prey to it. Greed is a familiar motivator for many of us. We'd like to think we're immune from that particular evil, but I mean, are we really? I mean, we've all been in situations where we selfishly want more than what we have where we want all of what we have, plus all of what those around us have, and still that's not enough to fill up that need, that desire within us. We hear about stories of greed all the time in the, in the news and social media, corporations putting the bottom line, their profit above the good of the employees, ringing out the absolute most productivity for the least, amount of money so that profit can be made on the backs of the people who make the least. We know that happens. We know folks embezzle money from their employers, their friends, their churches even, simply because they want what belongs to someone else. We know stories of where companies have abused the environment because of greed. It can be cheaper sometimes just to pay people off than to do the right thing. We all know more personal stories of greed, things that that hit home, that people have done wrong to us and, and things that we have done wrong to others because of greed. We know it happens, and it's not just something that happens out there. It's definitely something that happens in here, too. We get a little envy, creates a little discontent in our lives, and then maybe we've left a door open to our heart for that particular thing. 
Or maybe it's not our particular temptation, part of our personal story. So before we get all judgy on Judas, we might want to remember that we all have something that we struggle with, yeah? See, we are really excited about Judas, Judas, because he's like an easy, evil foil, right? I mean, like it is clear he is the bad guy in this story. So we can, we can jump on him and not feel any guilt. Can we? See, that is not actually the focus of this particular story. Well, look what Judas did and, and how awful he is and how, how evil he is and, and also it makes us feel better because, oh my gosh, I would never do that. But the thing is, when we do that, we miss the best part of the story, the part where we get to remember the redemption of Judas by Jesus. Because Jesus fed Judas. It really is the most amazing part of this story that Jesus fed Judas. Just let the beauty and the heartbreak of that action sink in for a moment. Glennon Doyle calls moments like this brutal, where it's beautiful and brutal all at once. See, when we focus on what Judas has done. We begin to prioritize that over what Jesus has done. And what Jesus did is so much more powerful. Because what did Jesus do? He fed Judas. By doing this, Jesus was doing what he always did, what he always does, which is fill a story, fill a space, fill a person with grace. And it is astounding. See, it's really tempting, is it not, to create this more like perfect, like Instagram worthy Last Supper right, where Judas is gone from the table, where he's slinked over to a dark, shadowy corner somewhere, jiggling the coins in his pocket, only to be seen again when he gets his comeuppance and he dies that miserable death. Like, we can, like, feel good about that. But the thing is, is Jesus isn't going to let that happen because that's not who Jesus is. We don't get to dismiss Judas from the table. That, that's not allowed. One writer said, by leaving Judas at the table, we leave room for proclamation. We leave room for Jesus to proclaim his grace and offer it to Judas, just like he does all the other disciples all the time, just like he does to each one of us. And he does it in such a way that it is present like the very air we breathe. Now, sometimes we think that grace and judgment can't go together, right? That they are, that they are opposite from one another. But Jesus, Jesus does offer some judgment here. He lets Judas know, hey man, I saw you. I know what you've done, and I think it's wrong. But he also lets Judas know that no matter what he's done, there is still room for him at that table right at Jesus' side. And that, my friends, is the best part of the story, the part that we need to know the most, the part that needs to be our focus because it reminds us that this is our story too, that there is always room for us no matter what we've done, no matter what shame we carry in our heart and in our brains, <laughs> from any past actions, no matter how many times we have held on to our own greed, hoping for some big payout at the end, no matter how many times 
We have treated other people badly in the past, even the immediate past, even if we drove in, walked through the door, and one minute before we were ugly to somebody, no matter how often we have judged others and held them up to an impossible standard that we ourselves cannot possibly meet, we see in this story that it is our story that there is always room for us. There is always room for you. Anytime we are tempted to just shove people out of the way, we see that we can't. There is no way that we can possibly exclude anyone and make ourselves comfortable at that table because if Jesus can feed Judas, his betrayer, so can we. It is the ultimate redemptive act. It is liberation at its finest. It is liberation from the things that hold us captive, that keep us us from accepting that grace, that love and acceptance that's offered so freely in this story. It is the antidote to everything we struggle with when we have a hard time with our own temptations, those things that bring us shame, make us feel guilt, keep us awake at night. This is the answer to those stories. One theologian said that this meal, this moment between Judas and Jesus is a foretaste of the feast to come, and it begs us to ask, what does fulfillment mean in the kingdom of God? We can only be fulfilled by something that has sufficient meaning in our lives, something greater than our individual selves. All the disciples struggled in those days with Jesus. Judas may be a little more than the rest, but he wasn't the only one. And we do too, even now. But it's not an impossible task to find that grace, to find that welcome. It is achievable for all of us to find fulfillment in our faith through the liberation that Jesus gave Judas when he fed him. An artist named Lyle Gwyn Garrity makes the statement that Judas wants to end uncertainty about his future, that he is afraid, and that is why he did what he did. He wants security and assurance and quick relief. He wants to go back to how things used to be, this pretend story in his head when things were better and all right. And so, Evil enters Judas's story like ink spilled across the page, but Judas, Jesus, doesn't let Judas's story end there. Instead, he welcomes him to the table, a table where fear and doubt and brokenness have a place too. He offers him a meal where, where brokenness just makes more to pass around. He pours into a common cup that will always threaten, that will always, he pours into a common, common cup that promises a way forward. It is a new future. Scarcity and fear and conflict will always threaten to dismember our story. But the artist goes on to ask us, can we remember in all of that that God has a greater story to tell, a story that remembers us and makes us whole? You know, Jesus extends that same meal to you and to me, a place where we too can remember and be made whole. And thank God for it. Amen.
Let us join in our pastoral prayer this morning. Before I begin, I was told this morning that our friend Doris is on hospice and her sister Dolores wanted us specifically to lift her up by name this morning and pray for her. And so we will do that as well. Let us begin. Creator God, prayer is not always easy for us. Our mind flutters with news, updates, and questions of faith, and our thoughts are like a river that won't stop. So today we take a deep breath, inhaling your name into our spirit, and willing your presence to wipe away any distractions and self-doubt and fear. And with that breath, we ask that you would tell us again how you moved over the waters and tell us again how you led your people with a pillar of fire and tell us again of that still small voice and then tell us and remind us of the prophets and tell us of Mary and Joseph and that angel chorus and the blind man and the leper and the crowds that you healed and, and tell us, God, what it was like to walk on water. Tell us of the little children who ran to you and of the justice you preached and of the hosannas and the palm branches. And tell us again, God, of the love that changed the world. Tell us again, because we are a forgetful people. It is part of our human nature. That is why we long for this space after week after week so we might be reminded of who we are and whose we are. So tell us again, for our anxiety is loud. Our fear of scarcity is loud. Our worry is loud. Our anger is loud. Our shame almost drowns us out, and our loneliness and our doubt is loud. So tell us again. Tell us again. Remind us of our story and how it began, of manna in the wilderness and disciples around the table. And tell us again of your love for this world, how it changes everything. Pour your spirit upon this table, upon us. Let your spirit wash over those who are scared and lonely and doubtful, who are struggling this morning, who are saddened. Let your spirit wash over Doris and Dolores both this morning. Tether your spirit to our fragile bones. Be with us in your extraordinary love and give us the strength to remember your story, which is our story. Amen. <laughs> 